Good afternoon. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Dr. Stacy Pettyjohn, a senior fellow and the director of the defense program here at CNAS. I'm very pleased to have joining me today at this special CNAS fireside, Congressman Adam Smith, the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee and the Democrat from Washington. Welcome, sir. Good to be here. Thank you. Um, today we're going to discuss the future of U.S. foreign and defense policy and how to best meet some of the nation's most pressing challenges. Before we dive into substance, a few quick administrative notes. Um, this is a public conversation. It's going to be recorded and will be available uh, after the fact on our website. Also, if you have questions as the audience, you can submit them. Please use the chat bar on your screen to do so, but make sure you identify yourself. We don't accept anonymous questions. So with that, I will turn it over to the Congressman for a few opening remarks. Great. Well, thank you. I had the appropriate time to have this conversation. It's certainly an interesting and challenging time. And I guess as we get ready to mark up the defense bill one week from the day in armed services, there's like sort of three overarching um, challenges. One, of course, is the global security environment, which is you know really complicated as we try to figure out how to deal with China, which has been, you know, a, a central focus for a number of years now. Russia inserting itself in the picture in Ukraine, continuing challenges from Iran and North Korea, and of course the uh, the ISIS and Al Qaeda folks haven't completely gone away as well. So how do we manage that threat environment um, with our, you know, by you know, while we're building partnerships and alliances across the world. So we're trying to figure that out. And second is the, the modernization uh, of our military. The rapid pace of change within technology and innovation and warfare is requiring us to modernize, you know, how we view warfare, you know, hybrid warfare becoming a bigger part of it. We see what's going on in Ukraine um, with, with drones and missiles and the importance of secure communications. How do we make sure our force is properly positioned for that? And then lastly is the, is the politics. Um, you know, we are very, very divided as a nation, and we've got the January 6th hearings going on. But at the same time, you know, being a representative of democracy, we have to figure out some way to function uh, working together. And we'll have that challenge next week in the Armed Services Committee, which I am knock on wood, I'm confident we will meet. But all three of those things are enormous challenges and they, they, they intermix in complicated ways. That's absolutely true. That, that is not a particularly um, positive picture for the future, but- um, Is I, what it is. I mean, I'm not- <laughs> No, 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 I agree so, with you. I, yeah. I, I would be interested in your opinion on um, the national defense strategy, which I know you've seen, and how you think it manages these various challenges that we face. The Department of Defense is obviously trying to modernize. Um, right. They have identified China as the pacing challenge, while Russia is an acute threat. Do you think they've figured out the right prioritization for these different challenges and that they set a clear path forward? I do. Um, and I think the most important part about the national defense strategy is the understanding that to meet all of those challenges, and, and we can get in the debate of, of ranking them. You know, China's the pacing threat, but Russia right now is you know, the, the, the most clear threat in the moment given what they're doing in Ukraine. I think the, the better way to look at it is all those threats are kind of intermixed. I mean, Russia and China in particular are very focused on ending the rules-based international order that we and partners and allies have put in place. Um, and essentially, they, what's bad for us is good for them sort of the way they're looking at it. And Iran, I think, has a, has a similar outlook. Um, so you have to bring all those together, which I think the national defense strategy does. But the most important part about it is recognizing we can't meet these challenges on our own. There's no new American century. There's no American first. There's no America exceptionalism. You know, we are a important partner in the world to try to move us towards a, you know, to maintain the rules-based system and to deal with these challenges. So the fact that the Biden administration has embraced coalition building, and diplomacy, and respect uh, for partners and potential allies in the world, I think is the most crucial part of that strategy. That's interesting. I agree with you. Um, I mean, it, that is definitely an asymmetric advantage that the United States has that um, potential rival countries really lack right now and something that we need to make sure that we leverage to the fullest extent possible and um, build the trust and sort of have a common understanding of how we're going to maintain the role-based order um, going forward. So I know you can't talk about the budget specifically because you're in the middle of marking up, but I was hoping you might be willing to discuss how well you think the president's budget requests 
aligns with his stated strategy and the Defense Department's strategy and whether you think that the two are supporting, if there are any things that they miss or um, areas where they're misaligned. I think it aligns quite well. Uh, I mean, look, you could always spend more money on something. You could always buy you know, something else over here. Uh, but it is really focused on, on modernization on you know, investments in, in new technologies and also in uh, taking offline systems that are no longer working for us. I mean, they're very aggressive about saying, you know, we are going to decommission a number of ships, you know, a number of planes and elsewhere so that we can focus our resources on the, the new technologies and the new systems that we most need, the, the JADC2 concept of joint all domain command and control, making our communication systems work. You know, it's emerged as one of the biggest issues in Ukraine right now is secure communications. Um, the Russians too often can hear what the Ukrainians are saying to each other and know where they are. So I think that the Biden administration is really focused on those modernizing um, functions that are so important to what we're doing. Now, you know, we, are, we can and we will quibble over exactly how much money to spend and how many you know, ships to buy, how many planes to buy. But to me, you know, getting the, the overall strategy right, focusing on modernization and knowing the most important systems going forward, the, the Biden budget reflects that quite well. That's good to hear. Um, modernization is something we've been striving for for a while, and the services and the department have encountered some obstacles when they come up to the hill. And sure. Uh, Oh, sorry. No, you I was going, just you were gonna, going someplace else, and I thought you were going. But go ahead. Yeah. I was going to ask you. Right. You know, divest invest has been widely criticized. Um, the Marines, General Berger, has a very clear vision of where he wants to take the service, but he has been forced to buy systems he doesn't want and uh, not allowed to retire some weapons that he believes are less relevant going forward. That's true, I think, across the department and all of the services. Do you feel like the the thinking on the Hill has changed? and that there's more willingness to recognize that we really do need to modernize and to make some significant changes to maintain our military technical advantage over the long run. Well, I mean, that is always going to face challenge, you know, three principal challenges, um, you know, Pentagon defense contractors and members of Congress, um, because there are incentives for all three that go in the opposite direction. Um, you know, the Pentagon has a pretty well entrenched bureaucracy and things move slowly. Lots of process involved before you make a decision. And if you're trying to modernize and go in a new direction, um, that can be a huge challenge. Um, you know, like the Pentagon's, the Pentagon is more process oriented than problem solving oriented. Though that is changing. And, and Calf Hicks, who's the deputy, I think has done an outstanding job of trying to move it in that direction to make them more nimble and more decisive and more quickly. But, you know, Rome isn't built in a day. Uh, members of Congress, of course, you know, we, <laughs> we always manage to come up with the argument for why that system that just coincidentally is built in our district is the single most important thing that we have to have. But I will say that on our committee, there's been a big change in that. I mean, I've always, you know, made a point of saying my job on the Armed Services Committee is not to bring home every last dollar to my district. Um, there are certain of my former colleagues that, you know, will have a heart attack at that concept. But um, I just think that's not what we're supposed to be doing. And there are a lot of new members, a lot of the, you know, the, the Marines, uh, Gallagher, Moulton, people that experience, they're seeing the future and they're less about those, you know, pet projects and parochialism and more about what's good for the force. But there will always be that fight. And then, of course, there's the contractors who just want to make as much money as possible. And if they can make a lot of money off of an existing system that they have a sole contract on, they're going to kind of work to make sure they keep that. But in all of those areas, there is a new urgency to not just do it the old way because we see what's happening with China. We see what's happening with Russia. Um, and I think there is good, solid leadership in the House now to move against those trends and make those modernizing decisions. I say that all confidently at the start of the process. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it plays out in practice. Um, but we, I think, I think there is some motivation there. And I should also mention uh, Congressman Rogers, mm -hmm. who's the ranking member on the committee. He and I are in complete agreement on that. Um, you know, there's enough money to go around for, you know, Alabama, Washington State, wherever. Let's make sure we're spending it, you know, wisely and effectively to get the military where it needs to be. I think that that ethos is more present in Congress today than, than it has been in any time that I've been here. That's very reassuring. And I didn't mean to point out, and uh, 
uh, identify Congress as the only obstacle, because you're absolutely no, right there. The Pentagon has its problems, and then you have industry, which has its own set of problems. And um, all of those, I think, speak to the fact why more money doesn't solve them, because it just creates more invested interests in the current way of doing things versus spending wisely and figuring out where you need to go in the future. Um, on, you talked a little bit about uh, Deputy Secretary Hicks' uh, attempts to change the Pentagon bureaucracy and to make it a little bit more flexible and uh, to make decisions more quickly so we can actually modernize and field some of these new systems within less than a decade. That, that, that's a long uh, goal right now. But there have been efforts to reform the Pentagon acquisition process. And a lot of them have been very successful. Like under the last administration, yeah. there were a lot of new authorities given. And I'm wondering whether you think it's time to overhaul the entire budgeting system, the PPPE process, which I know is being looked at by a commission, right. um, or whether you think that the Pentagon actually has the authorities that it needs and it's the culture and a huge um, amount of risk aversion within the bureaucracy that prevents it's, it from. Yeah. It's a combination of all of those things. Now, I should say, I mean, Ash Carter was really the, mm -hmm. the first Secretary of Defense who really went after this issue. And I think that's been consistent through all three administrations. I mean, even under the Trump administration, mainly because President Trump until the end was not paying much attention to the Department of Defense, thank God. Um, but, you know, a series of secretaries of defense there continued that that principle of how can we modernize it. Also, you know, my predecessor in this committee, Mac Thornberry, uh, I worked with him on some of it, but Mac unquestionably was the leader in giving that authority. I think right now it is more culture than authority. Um, I think they have the, the, the authorities. We're looking at a couple little things that maybe can add to that or emphasize that. But then you really have to shift that culture. Now, I, and I think they've got the ability, but I also think it would be very much worth taking a hard look at some of the, you know, the culture process issues that are in the way the Pentagon does, does business. There was an article in Foreign Affairs a couple months back, I, um, I forget who wrote it, that basically you know, drew the analogy that you know, the Pentagon is still operating like it's a 1950s automobile company. Um, you know, McNamara, mm -hmm. you know, that's sort of how we're running. When we don't need to make you know, Fords in 1955, we need to make Apple computers in 2022. And the way modern businesses have encouraged innovation and creativity and have gotten out of that, because you're not doing the same thing over and over and over again. You're innovating, you're being creative, but there's a culture that you build. Um, and the biggest aspect of that culture, and I'll keep this short because I have a ton of analogies that can take me forever once I start talking about this, is problem solving instead of process. Process says, okay, let's set up, you know, the, here's the best process to get the result. And let's, you know, we'll worry about that later. We'll just follow the process and we follow the process and get the result. Problem solving is, okay, what are we really trying to do here? And if somewhere along the way you're like, ah, if we did this, we'd get there quicker. At the Pentagon, it's like, you see that and you go, yeah, but we still got five li lines of, you know, authority that we got to go through and we got to go do it. So, we'll, we'll, no, we've got to be able to nimble enough to say, and this gets back to the requirements process. There are way too many requirements. I, you know, standard joke I've been telling now is I want to be like Thanos. And if you haven't watched the Marvel movies, you have no idea what I'm talking about when I say that. And just snap my fingers and make half of the requirements go away. And I don't care which half. All right, let's just start somewhere um, so that we have more flexibility in the system. So I, I, think, I, I think we are on the right path, but we still need to make big, bold change is the, the way I would sum it up. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. When you look, uh, I mean, top-down, linear process, when people can't even envision the sort of capabilities and technologies that are being developed today in the private sector, let alone how you might be able to employ them with existing systems to totally revolutionize how you go about it, um, we're really hampering ourselves by not doing it. And there's been a lot of innovation and progress made but I feel like there's also a good bit of innovation theater and that you have pockets where, uh, of excellence where you see one part of the Pentagon, one organization that's moving forward, but it's so personality-based and that individual yeah. leaves and then uh, it, it doesn't, it's not institutionalized. Well, I understood. In, in, in the per you can institutionalize personalities, okay? 
but you build a culture, and I've seen it in, in, in my own office and the people who have come in. Once you get senior leaders who are willing to take that sort of innovative approach, people may come in, with it, but, but they see that, and they, okay, this is the mm -hmm. culture, this is what's the, and you sort of build that approach, and that's what we need. You can't just have the one leader who comes in who, you know, but no, you have to build the culture so that is how everyone feels that leadership is supposed to be done. Yeah. I wanted to turn to some of the most pressing challenges. Um, so talk about China and Taiwan and then maybe Ukraine a little bit um, before we run out of time. And if the audience has questions, please do submit them. We might be able to get to a few. Um, so first, let's look at China since that's how the Pentagon's prioritized it. Um, and I'm curious what you think are the most important steps that DOD needs to take today to strengthen the deterrence. Well, I, I would go back to the modernization issue. You know, we've war-gamed for better than a decade now and consistently haven't liked the result. Now, I will say that part of the problem with the road game is we're, or sorry, with, with the war game is we're fighting on the road. Okay, you know, I mean, we have, we have to, and that makes it more difficult. Um, but what are the technologies that we could develop to actually better deter? And I cite this example all the time. The Air Force did a war game just a year or so ago where they said, okay, instead of doing it the way we normally do it, let's imagine that we have some of those technologies that we want to develop, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that we have, you know, more drones, we have more secure communications, we have better missiles, you know, that were things that we're developing. And they put them on the battlefield and the red team commander looked at this and said, I don't want to fight. Um, at which point they said, well, this is actually an exercise, so you don't have a choice. You have to fight, and we want to see how it comes out. But that's where we want to get to. We want to get to China, looking at Taiwan, or gosh, they've got claims in India and you know, half a dozen other countries as well, and say, we're not going there. Okay? And that is a matter of developing these new, innovative, modernized technologies that make the other side systems more vulnerable, not yours. And that's about satellites and space and secure communications and drones and better missiles and better counter drone capability and all of that. So that is the most important mission, is to have a strong enough deterrent. And then I'll come back to where I started, allies, partners. Um, Japan is stepping up quite a bit. Um, South Korea, you know, they try to stay focused on, on North Korea. Um, but we've seen with the Quad, with Australia and India. And this is why it is so important, and this is where the diplomacy piece of it comes in. We have to get these countries on our side. You know, and, and, and again, the whole American exceptionalism, we're better than you, mm, yeah. um, no one's going to like that. I mean, even if it's true, which it's not, um, people wouldn't like it. But given our stumbles over the course of the last 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan and elsewhere, I think a more humble, cooperative, we need you, let's work together to build a better world, not just for us, but for everybody. So that's the, you know, build partnerships and build the right deterrence. Those are the two most important things we need. Well, then the third thing is, if we could find a way to, to get along with China, you know, to get China to recognize that it's not a zero sum game, they're hung up on this notion that they're gonna bury us or something. And as I've said, we're not going anywhere. Um, and neither is China. China's going to be a big, powerful country. Let's, the world is, in fact, big enough for the both of us, and we need to look for opportunities to try and convince them of that. I hope that proves to be true. Um, we run a lot of games here at CNAS with a gaming lab, and we recently partnered with Meet the Press. And one of our conclusions was really the power of our alliances and having to, being able to build coalitions and bring them. And um, I completely agree that modernization is overdue for the Pentagon, and we need to change the way that we plan to fight and the type of systems that we have. But um, I worry about risk in the near term and uh, how to mitigate that and strengthen det deterrence. And I think that deepening our cooperation and strategic and operational coordination with allies and partners is one of those steps, improving posture, buying the munitions we need. Um, yeah. that, and all of that really does make it look unattractive if you're in Beijing and thinking about it. Um, so President Biden has stated a number of different times now that the U.S. would actually defend Taiwan, um, although the administration has later qualified those statements. Do you think that um, strengthening deterrence requires the United States moving away from its policy of strategic ambiguity? I don't. I think strategic ambiguity is just fine. Um, I think what we need to focus on 
is what we said, what I said in the answer to the first question, having an adequate deterrence. I mean, because I mean, look, at the end of the day, what will you do if China attacks Taiwan? Nobody knows. And you're not going to know until it happens. I mean, there really isn't, an, I guess the only alternative to strategic ambiguity is simple ambiguity. Um, you can call it what you want, but I'm not ex obsessively focused on that. I think the strategic ambiguity works just fine. We've got to build the capabilities. Okay. Flipping to the Europe, going to the other side of the world, we've been watching the war in Ukraine, and it seems to have shifted fairly significantly. Russia's effort at regime change failed spectacularly. They were pushed back. But now um, that it has moved from a war of maneuver into a war of attrition, and is limited sort of to the eastern areas, mainly the Donbass. It looks like Russia is making a lot of gains. It appears that the Ukrainian forces are suffering considerable attrition, and we've heard from Ukrainian officials that they need more military equipment now, and heavy military equipment, munitions. Do you think the United States is providing Ukraine with what it needs? Um, does it need to go further in terms of the long-range rockets and drones? bigger systems, more of them, um, to support the defense of Ukraine? Yeah, I think it's primarily a numbers game at this point, in that we, I believe, are providing, you know, a lot. Um, but even the munitions that we are providing, the, the artillery um, and all that, they just need a lot. And, you know, there's only so much, you know, we, we, we can pump in there. We're, we're, we're pump, pumping in a, a lot. Maybe we need to work on the logistics a little bit more with the Ukrainians to make sure once it gets there, it goes where it's needed more quickly. And we could certainly increase the volume, and, and, and we should. Um, I, I do think the only thing that we're not doing that we should be doing is I think we should be more aggressive about what we're giving them. I don't agree with the president on the notion that we shouldn't give them long-range strike missiles because I think... He's sort of buying into Putin's rhetoric here. Well, if you've got a missile that's capable of striking Russia, that's provocative. Well, every single piece of artillery we send them is capable of striking Russia because Ukraine's like right on the border with Russia. Um, the longer range stuff is not about going into Russia. It's about giving you the ability to have a more standoff capability to hit the Russians who are in Ukraine. Because if the Russians can see farther and shoot farther, then you're at a disadvantage. So I think we should give them the longer range munitions. And I also think we should be getting them more drones more quickly. I don't agree with the foot dragging uh, on the Gray Eagle. And I've heard the arguments and I know what they are. Some of them are classified, but none of them to my mind carry the day. I think we should be getting more drones because that comes ISR. Mm -hmm. the, the Russians have, they have, Russians communications are more secure and they can see farther and see better. So we need to help with that. I think the other thing that we need to start thinking about, and the real concern is what Putin wants to do right now is lock in his gains. All right, I'll, you know, he'll eat Ukraine by one small bite at a time instead of the all-encompassing envelopment that he envisioned at the beginning. But that's just as deadly. Um, anyone who thinks he's going to stop at eastern Ukraine, if he happens to get this, maybe he'll pause and take a breath. But we've heard, you've heard his comments about you know, Peter the Great. And this is a vanity project for Putin. This is, I will expand Russia and make it greater to make myself look good. Um, and there's no end to that. The only end is to actually deter him. So what I'm building up to is we need to start thinking about what does an insurgency look like in those portions of Ukraine that are currently occupied by Russians. Because um, what, what the Russians are doing, as you know, they're executing people, they're deporting them. They're, they are really engaged in genocide against Ukrainians in a certain part of the country. Um, and I think we need to start contemplating how we can support an insurgency to fight back against that. Long-term planning. I mean, the wars changed so quickly. And I, I think many people realized in the early stages that we were probably coming to premature conclusions and uh, yeah. overly optimistic. But um, it definitely does seem like capabilities like drones where the Ukrainians aren't putting people at risk with flying them either, in addition to being able to get the intelligence and longer range systems since the Russian artillery out, yeah. outranges them, um, could be very helpful. One final uh, question uh, related to Ukraine. So Putin has um, engaged in nuclear threats and saber rattling repeatedly throughout the crisis. And I think this really has um, had a demonstration effect or I fear that it has. 
Um, and we've seen across the world where North Korea is really developing a lot of new missiles and delivery systems potentially for its small nuclear arsenal. China is uh, investing in an unprecedented buildup yeah. for them. There's a lot of people out there with nukes, no two yeah. worries about it. Exactly. And my fear is that nuclear weapons are salient again. Um, and that raises the question of what we need to deter their use. And I know this is a controversial topic on the um, on the Hill in, in different budget debates. And President Biden has um, recommend not author cut the slick amend. The yeah. Look, I can. I, we need to modernize our nuclear force. There's no doubt about that. But I mean, the two biggest ways we can modernize our nuclear force are in the submarine force and the bomber force. You know, these are survivable, these are movable, these place our adversaries at risk. And we're doing that. We're building the B-21, uh, we're building the new, um, the, the nuclear submarines, well, they're all nuclear powered, but the nuclear capable Columbia. submarines. Um, you know, I have more mixed emotions about the ground-based um, strategic deterrent. Um, I think that the program's going well, but do we need it? Is, is it a good investment of our resources? But that's what we need to, to modernize and deter that. And we, we have a lot of nuclear weapons. Um, we have a fair number of them um, that are capable of deterring, and I think we need to make that, that clear. But I do think right now Putin is just using that to try to get us to stand down so he can enslave Ukraine. And I think we need to understand what's at stake here, um, that if Putin is able to do this, he is then puts himself in a position to do it again, and he gives comfort to China if they think about doing it as well. And I think we have the capability of stopping Putin without risking that nuclear war. Putin has drawn like 12 different red lines already that we've crossed, and he hasn't done anything because he knows if he does anything to bring NATO in, he's done. He loses. There's no way he wins if we come in. So I think we're giving him too much ability to stare us down when we have a more than adequate deterrent and we have more that we could be doing um, at this point to, to help Ukraine in the fight. I, I agree with you on the fact that, um, you know, we need to stand firm and continue to assist the Ukrainians. And on the modernization, I, I think the whole triad is important right now. There's a lot of things that are fluid in the international system and that making big changes um, could introduce unnecessary uncertainty especially in the part of allies and partners. Um, and so uh, I think that we have to also think about nuclear deterrence, not that we want to use them. And I don't know if we need any additional capabilities to what we have, but we need to be cognizant of the fact that countries might wield them and figure out how oh, we... We have to have a deterrence. And look, I, you know, I, I think we, you know, in many cases, have spent too much money on nuclear weapons going into it. But, but the, you can't unring the bell. Mm -hmm. The technology exists, and the only way to stop people from using nuclear weapons at this point is to have that adequate deterrent. We do, mm -hmm. and we need to maintain it. I, I agree with that. I would also say we should start having conversations. I mean, we should start having, you know, uh, arms control discussions. Yeah. I mean, that was a cornerstone with, you know, Kennedy through Nixon through Reagan. That, And I'm worried right now we're not having those conversations with Russia or China because now you introduce missile defense um, there's a lot of different things that come in that you know upset that calculation I am vastly more worried about that miscalculation than I am about the conflict in Ukraine you know triggering a nuclear war we're not talking with the Russians that way we we need to have conversations about arms control to make sure that we all have adequate deterrence we don't think that one's going to get a jump on the other, and we're all very clear on the fact that we're not going to use them except to deter any nuclear weapons from ever being used. I think we need to start arms control negotiations. I totally concur. I am not sanguine about the prospects of that happening in the near term with either Beijing or Moscow. But Fair enough. I think we are out of time. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Congressman Smith, thank you so much for being here. It's been a really interesting conversation. Thank you for the chance.